school, but actually, um, they do very much come out of uh, out of real experience. And this first poem has a bit of black humor in it, and it does recount some of the uh, rather bizarre, almost absurd things that people did to avoid service in uh, uh, in Vietnam. It's entitled "Taking the Easy Way." A friend of mine shot himself in the foot, carefully aimed not to shatter a bone. Said he was just cleaning his 22 before going into the Air Force. Well, all it did was delay his time by three weeks. Hardly worth it. Another guy, actually a friend of a friend in San Francisco at the Art Institute, got drunk, popped some pills, bent his arm backwards on a table, and had someone jump on his elbow, breaking it the wrong way. Splinters of bone jutted out of his flesh and his face just as white as his bone. Jesus. All that just to avoid the draft, and with a mind like that, he would have done just fine in Vietnam. <laughs> Black humor, of course, has been used uh, extensively in, in war poetry, and it's fun to play with. Um, Although the bodies of poetry for each war are distinctly different, they are yet tied together by some strange truth. And this next poem I want to read is uh, a poem that comes out of World War I, and it has some ties to the present. It's entitled, The Psalm. You kind of wonder, every year or so, on hearing of a farmer killed by plowing up an old artillery shell somewhere in the fields of France, the shell working its way up within reach of the silver tines and exploding after all these years. You kind of wonder if they ever change the numbers in any recorded history of the war and add one more to the list of the dead. One of my first assignments after I graduated from the infantry school at, uh, at Fort Benning was to run the gas chambers at, at Benning. And I have this poem that comes out of that experience. It's entitled CBR, you know what that is, chemical, biological, radiological. And this one is dedicated to the uh, M17A1 protective mask. At the end of the day, after all that good training, first the block of solid instruction in the bleachers, the practical demonstrations, all that practice with the mask, putting it on, clearing it, testing the seal, looking like alien creatures from some grade B movie in the 50s, and then the gas chambers. First, CS, going in masked, Black rubber tight to the face, flutter valve sucking in and out with each labored breath, and always the smell, the taste of rubber and plastic swimming in that swirl of smoke, dark, highly contaminated, an atmosphere from some other planet, hot and uninhabitable. Then, taking it off, reciting for the Sarge name, rank, serial number, maybe a question from the twelve standing orders, and then, with tears streaming down, they're let loose into the fresh, warm air that clears their eyes and lungs, brings home the truth that the mask works. Next, after a short break, the second chamber, chlorine gas this time, just like World War I, and they go in unmasked, double time, line up inside against the walls, two squads at a time, adrenaline pumping, waiting for the command to mask, the admonition to clear it, before taking a breath. And one kid, trying to cheat, had unbuttoned his canvas bag and his mask had fallen out, chlorine turning his brass a sickly green like his face, his panicking eyes wild with fright. I looked at him, made him stand there for a moment and think about it. Afterwards, when the young recruits thought the training was over and they're standing in formation, giving, giving the order to smoke them if they've got them, we'd see what they had learned. Pops four CS grenades clamped at the end of mop handles and ran around the troops surrounding the formation with gas. And some of them stood, put on their masks as they'd been trained to do, cleared them, ready for anything, while others ran, dropping equipment everywhere. Rifles, canteens, helmets, pistol belts, and more. And the drill sergeants were pissed, had to round up their troops making them late for dinner. And this one guy climbed up a tree, poured water from his canteen over his head, and called for his mama, and the sergeant yelled, Get your white ass out of that tree, you dumb fuck, or I'll show you your mama. And then they take all that equipment dumped on the ground and throw it in the CS chamber in a pile and make all those dumb fucks go in there and sort it out, making sure they'd picked up their own rifles, and those sergeants would check the numbers to make sure. 
And this one kid just sat there in the dirt, kneeling, coughing, gas still thick in the air, and I walked over to him and held that smoking grenade under his face and yelled, put your mask on. And he looked up at me, tears running out of his bloodshot eyes, and says, I've only got one lung. And I say, then you'd better save that one goddamn lung and put that mask on. And I held that grenade there, not believing anyone could be so dumb not to use what he has learned, knowing that mask would save all that pain, and yet he wouldn't put it on, and I wouldn't put down that grenade. In all my dreams, I still stand there, grenade smoking on the end of that mop handle, holding it close to his face, making him learn and learn and learn. And I'd still do that today, knowing no matter how good the training, we never learn anything. That ignorance brings its own reward that I'm still standing there. This is a poem about um, coming back. It's entitled Back in the Land of the Big PX. Once, when I was sick, I woke up sweating my sheets wet at noon in August in Philadelphia. The air in my apartment <clears throat> stale. The air outside rank with the smell of a stale city in summer. A fish hawker passed by, crying out with some old world charm. I looked out into the street, saw two cops pick up their weekly stash, small bills, and some coke from the dudes who sold dope every Thursday from noon until three. I went to the back window and looked out over the black tar roof of the second floor apartment below me and threw out some bread for the birds. A dozen pigeons came within minutes, their snotty beaks pecking at crusts, their pink feet scrabbling over oily tar, softening in city heat. I picked up a slingshot I'd made and placed a stove bolt in its leather pouch. I pulled back, aiming for the broad back of a pigeon pecking away only a few feet below. The bolt skimmed off his back and embedded in tar. They all rose a few feet off the roof and settled back as if nothing, not even their lives, were more important than those few moldy slices of bread. I picked up a wood screw, fired a direct hit this time in the middle of its back. But it bounced off and again they flew away, only to return with their ravenous disregard, their intense hunger compelling me to prey on that hunger, that blind drive slapping the hard face of reason. I found another projectile, a nail this time, and aimed at that pigeon so damned unfazed by the hit that he took. I pulled back as far as I could and released. The nail sliced through his feathers and stuck into his back as he lifted above the roof. I watched him circle over row houses across the alley, backyards filled with trash, a dead cat swelling in the sun. I threw out more bread and they all came back, including the one I'd stuck with that nail, but the nail had worked out and he ate as if nothing had happened. I laughed through the sweat, the smell of hot tar, and I wished I had never come home. Strangely, I have been um, writing a number of um, poems that combine baseball and, and Vietnam. And this first one I'm going to read is entitled Something Like a War, and it comes from a, uh, a line that uh, Ty Cobb had said. Ty Cobb said baseball is something like a war, as if coming in with your spikes sharpened and high were the equivalent of fre flesh shredded by a fragmentation grenade or a booby-trapped 105 round. But the metaphor doesn't hold. Even if Albert Bell broke a shortstop's nose, dislocated his shoulder, and raked his spikes along the bone from ankle to knee as Bell ran out of his way between second and third, it wouldn't be even a mild skirmish between two friends drunk on a Saturday night and looking for trouble. Any good player could always pick himself up, dust his uniform off, and play the next day. Baseball is nothing like a war. There's another one of those poems from that, uh, that sequence. It's entitled, Playing Baseball in the Army, Company Picnic, 1967. We practiced for weeks before playing the NCOs at the company picnic. And the colonel warned, they've got a pitcher, Sergeant Sims, who will put a spin on the ball so tight, all you'll do is pop up to the infield nine times out of ten. And we did. We met Sims' arrogant proficiency the way we met the ball, one easy pop-up after another, until, in the middle innings, I cut it hard, sent it bounding over third, and waltzed in for a double. I looked at him and grinned. You won't do that again, Lieutenant, he said. 
but I did. Only I went the other way, hit a sucker pitch between first and second, had to slide as the right fielder broke in on the ball, making it a close one, and the hard tag stung, leaving a welt for a week. Sims didn't say anything, just stood on the mound rubbing the ball into his glove. But he handed me a beer after the game, and we talked of the great games we'd seen, the ones we'd played, or of players who made impossible plays. When he didn't come back to his wife and son, the son he played catch with after a long day on the ranges, training recruits, I remembered our company picnic, the game we'd played that afternoon, and I still think of those hard grounders, his pitches fast, burning across the plate, nicking the corners, except that one easy mistake, chest high, seeming to hang like a grenade, daring me to hit it. And I still call out to the mound, pitch it to me, Sarge, make it a good one, come on, pitch to me. The air, the fading sun, hangs heavy over the plate. Last one I want to do is uh, a poem entitled Night Ambush. Every day he tells me he's put the war behind him. He doesn't watch the movies, doesn't read the books. The scars on his arm are covered always, even on the hottest days of summer. I tell him the story of my uncle, a veteran of World War II who fought on Okinawa. He grew a beard to cover the hollowed part of his reconstructed chin and jaw and went through life with everyone thinking he was eccentric, unshaven, and they jokingly called him Abe, never knowing his story, never the least concerned. Last night, the fireflies were thick in the backyard, points of light like tiny explosions in the distance, and we watched until the silence crawled into our bones and slept. Like children, we'd read to story after story, marking time like tracers. We have another beer and say good night. He leaves the same way he came with the same story. I go upstairs, read a story to my daughter, a story that ends strongly, properly, with closure, strong as a door being shut after the lights are turned off. I turn on the hallway light, targeting the shadows and doorways, go downstairs, have a last beer before I close up the house for the night. My daughter wakes a while later, says there's something under her bed. I come up, say the darkness is her friend, it lets her sleep and dream. I tell her there is nothing there as I lift the dust ruffle and look underneath. I tell her there's nothing to be afraid of but I don't look into her questioning face, hoping she won't see, will never know, that I'm still afraid of the dark. Thank you.